Recording in progress. Who doesn't love that sound? Recording in progress. We all love that sound. Hi, guys. A very warm welcome as everybody's coming in now. I think everyone's just linking up to the video and to the audio. So a massive warm welcome to everybody to our traditional Tuesday fortnightly property networking webinar. It's great to have you all on board. I'm seeing more and more faces pop up here, more and more names pop up here. Uh, the session will be recorded, so if you don't want to appear, please just turn your camera off and turn your microphone off. If you really don't want to be on here, um, then obviously we will send you a recording of it afterwards. But by staying on here, that's your consent for us to record it. So guys, a very warm welcome. It's lovely to see everyone. And indeed, we've got some familiar faces and we've got some new faces. So just going around my screen, I know it's going to be different for everyone else. We've got Jamie French. We got Luke Watkins, we got Dale, we got Spiro, we got Gemma, we got Shalini, Katie, Sophie, Darius, Reese, Rakina, Tracy, Antonio, Gary, and Sam. Hope I haven't missed anyone. Oh, we got Lisa Curtis, our estate agent, our friendly estate agent. She's just about to join us now as well. She's a stalwart. She's always, always on our Tuesday evening uh, webinars, apart from when she's climbing the mountains. So it's great to have everyone on board. So. Yeah, really warm welcome to everybody. Those who are here for the first time, if you just want to give me a thumbs up, raise your hand just to say hello. Hi, uh, yes. Ah, oh, Spiro. Yes, we've spoken on the phone, haven't we, uh, a couple of weeks ago? Great. Yes, we have, Ben. You well? Yeah, very good. Yes, yeah. Great to see you, Spiro. Thanks for joining us. Oh, pleasure to be here. Great stuff. Before you move on, uh, Tracy and Darren, can you turn your camera off, please? Because I was enjoying the picture of your wedding because Darren looked like a young Elton John. Did anyone know? <laughs> <that vibe? laughs> Come on now. <laughs> that was the second wedding, Jamie. Yeah, actually, yes. <laughs> we did it twice. <laughs> Lovely stuff. And also, a very warm welcome to Antonio. He just um, put his hand up there. So, a very warm welcome to Antonio. Welcome. To your first session on South Wales Property and working on traditional fortnightly Tuesday evening networking webinar. Um, I was thinking tonight what we could talk about. I just put a video out earlier. I was parked up in between appointments. It suddenly came to me. A lot of people are asking me what is going to happen now the interest rates have gone down. I say gone down. They put them down by 0.25%. So in my mind, not a lot. There's two things. A, it is going to affect the mortgage market, and B, it is going to affect the property market. Because although it may not make any financial difference, I believe it will make a massive difference to consumer confidence. Because those people that were holding back to see what was going to happen when we have a new government and, and whether we were going to put the interest rates back down. As some people say, put the interest rates back down, what, back down to 0.25% or 0.01%? No, it's not going to happen. But a lot of people that were holding on, waiting, chance in their arm on the fact that interest rates were going to go down. Those people that are holding up buying properties or moving house or whatever they were doing as a result of waiting for this have now got the opportunity to move forward and do it. So just wanted to talk to you about that. And obviously we've got Jamie French, founder and managing director of Notebook Money, your mortgage and finance brokers here with us this evening. Um, so Jamie's going to be uh, our expert insight into how this enormous rate change is going to alter the world of mortgages forever. Over to you, Jane. Got mad eyes going on. So I mean, I mean, I've had a really good day, and I feel like a child when I've had a good day. If anyone that knows me, um, did you? So, did you want me to talk about interest rates? Sorry, then, Ben, because you broke up on my side. Yes, yes, sorry, I'm just busy letting other people in and just sorting out the admin here. Uh, yes. say, what difference do you think it's going to make to the mortgage market? Not necessarily the mortgage products themselves, but, you know, in, in general, consumer confidence. And, you know, you're obviously dealing with applicants, first-time yeah. buyers, home movers, investors, oh, right. and you're dealing with them every single day. What difference will, will this change in interest rates make in your view? So my synopsis of the market is that it's been a really weird uh, month for any of you that haven't spoken to me. Quite shocked. I would never have put money on this last month, but we had interest rates, not the Bank of England base rate, interest rates from lenders dropping their rates three days before an election. Um, 
which is quite unusual. The Bank of England base rate has obviously come down, which has helped. We're expecting interest rates to continue to drop. However, uh, no one really knows, uh, and I'll come on to market perception, and we're, we're seeing a difference as a firm, and um, people I speak to, as I speak to estate agents all over, uh, is um, we're expecting to float around a little bit now. We're just seeing about half percent interest rates drop. But the real big testing point is going to be the 30th of October. Does anyone know what's happening on the 30th of October? Budget. The budget. The budget. Um, and if, we, if we've already seen that Labour are making changes that they said they wasn't going to make, uh, and let's not get political who voted who, because that will end up with people getting shanked and stuff, because some of you are from Newport. Um, I was aimed at you, Ben. Um, is that until that happens, I don't really know what's going to happen. But because the base rate's changed, the the actual confidence in, mar- in the market's increased. Like, I've seen more people come back in at the higher level. So if you speak to most of the state agents at the moment... Anything sub £300,000 is still selling. That market hasn't really changed because a lot of those are first-time buyers and they're comparing their rent to what it is owning so they don't know anything different. Whereas when you're speaking to people who've got £300,000 plus houses and they've got a mortgage at the moment, I spoke to somebody today whose mortgage was only small, was £81,000. Uh, it's come up for renewal. She's currently paying £373 a month. Her new mortgage payments are £486 a month. So when you, and that's only a small mortgage balance. So I think the whole confidence is increasing. And that's why we're seeing more of the chunkier stuff, uh, activity in the higher end of the market, which obviously helps everything because those people need to move and upsize in order for your first time buyer to buy their houses, etc. So my general consensus is I think the market's strong still. I think there's opportunity in any market, but really October is going to be the um, the real uh, real point where we understand. Like, let's if we talk about the budget. Does anyone – this is major. So what I'm about to do is to keep it really simple. Anyone that knows me knows I'm really analytical. I read every day. I'm boring. It's a way not to speak to the wife um, is – has everyone seen what Labour have done with school fees, private school fees? Yeah. My wife's heard that, see, she's messaged me. Um, do, do, does anyone not know what they've done with the school fees? In fact, don't answer that. I'll answer it for you just in case you don't have to alienate yourself. Is they now in, incorporate in VAT onto private healthcare, their private school fees, which wasn't there before. Now, it was a tax break. Like We're VAT exempt. In, in the finance brokerage, we're exempt. We don't have to pay... VAT on advice, um, which they've now introduced into private school. Now that means the average, the app by a kid going to private school and paying for his education or his parents, that saves the government seven and a half thousand pounds in money that they don't have to invest into public se- into the public sector because that ch- child. Now we're going to have an influx of, you know, kids coming back into. Um, the public sector, but then their argument is we're now taxing private schools, so it should balance itself back out, and we should be able to recruit teachers. Well, actually, if you've got more people, if you've got less people paying tax now because they can't afford it, the, the math doesn't make sense. Does that make sense? So understanding what they're going to do with a budget as a whole is going to be the real point. But right now, I think the market's strong. People are coming back in. Anything sub £300,000 selling. Um, and yeah, that's my my synopsis. Anyone want to shoot me down? No, I won't shoot you down. I'll actually deal with you. It's quite an interesting thing which you mentioned there because I was going to talk about the property market, and you're exactly right what you're saying. What all the estate agents are saying. Now, if we rewind to when we came out of lockdown, it was quite a crazy market. People were paying over the odds for property. Properties were selling. The first day they were listed, they were selling for over asking price. There was block viewings on properties you'd never have block viewings on before. Because if we look at the sub, let's take the MP postcode area and let's look at the sub £300,000 market. They are what I would call essential moves. So people that want to buy a house, 
people, first time buyers and people that need more space. So they need to go from a, a flat to a house or, 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 or a house to a bigger house because they're expecting another baby or the family's expanding, the kids are growing up, they need more space, etc. They are essential moves. When you look at a family that settles or perhaps a couple where the kids have flown the nest, they may choose to buy a more expensive house because they've no longer got school fees minus the VAT. They've no longer got obviously the cost of, of, of having the children around them anymore. The business is doing particularly well and they want a house in perhaps a, a nicer area. You know, they want, for example, in Newport, they want to move to the Ridgeway in Newport. A million pound houses were selling the same day for over asking price, which in Newport had never, ever happened before. I've worked as an estate agent extensively in the MP postcode area. It's never happened before, but it did happen. Then we fast forward to a few months ago when there was so much hype about the interest rate. I think, uh, you, you know, 14 consecutive months, the interest rate was put up. Um, and obviously, people... 21, went, I think it was, mate. Sorry? 21, I think, consecutive in the end. Well, 21 was it in the end? Wow. Yeah. Um, so 21 consecutive interest rate rises, plus there was obviously a lot of, I wouldn't say insecurity, but a, a lot of unsettlement about the fact that perhaps we were going to have a general election and what whatever else was actually going on, that the non-essential moves were deciding, well, actually, we don't need to move. It's not essential. We can stay put. So let's let's stay put for the next 12 to 18 months. Let's see what happens to interest rates. Let's see what happens to the property market. Let's see how our careers, our jobs, our, our businesses are all performing. And in 12 to 18 months, we'll make the decision then. And I think a lot of people now have been sat on the fence and they've been waiting. We've had the news that obviously we've got a new government. Um, obviously, the little snippets are coming out here. And then some positive news about the new government was obviously about their, their pledges to House Bill. But who knows? Will they fulfill their pledges? That's yet to be seen. But on a secondary note, that's provided settlement. And also, now that the interest rates have been brought down, that's given a lot of consumer confidence. So I think a lot of these people that were sat on the fence with non-essential moves, aka in the MP postcode area, the over £300,000 mark, are now deciding, yes, Let's go and do it. Let's move. Let's go. And of course, as Jamie quite rightly said, that's fueling the market. So of course, that's making, you know, sometimes I can remember selling million pound houses at, at the Ridgeway and you'd be in a chain six deep. So it would start off with a million pound house and it would go down to a hundred thousand pound flat. And of course, as everybody's stepping up the ladder, it's making these properties available. So it's fueling the market and the market is moving, which is great news. That's what we want. We want a moving market. A static market is no good for anyone. We can make money in a static market as savvy investors. We can make money in a static market, an increasing market, a declining market. But at the same time, for our economy, our state of mind, we like an increasing market. So that's all really interesting. Darius, Darius has got his hand up. Can, can, you, oh, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you, Darius. Yeah. yeah. Um, just the perspective that I've been sort of thinking of and contemplating, um, given the numbers in overall, I think there was only 231,000 of houses built in 2023. Um, and that's in the context of a population increase of around 610,000 last year as well. So I think that will be a very... <clears throat> strong pressure on the house prices going up in overall as well not only the the the, the aspects you've mentioned but also just a pure number of extra people as well being in, in in the market for the new houses and that population increase is not from bear freight by the way yeah you are exactly right there we've never since i mean it's after the second world war the highest in 75 years by the way if anybody been tracking those so what's the highest in 75 years that population increase. I can well imagine, yeah, yeah. What you'll find though, is that since obviously uh, after the Second World War, we built massive, massive social housing estates. You see them in every town, every city, huge estates. Some of them had 10,000 properties on them. Since the 60s and 70s, we have not built on that scale for social housing. And to cap it off, most of it's been sold off on, under the council right to buy scheme. 
So we are building social housing, but not on the scale that we need to be building. So the nation is now dependent upon private rental stock. That's a really important factor. Private rental stock. It's unbelievable the government makes it so difficult to become a landlord and continuously difficult. But we are dependent as a nation on private rental stock. And also, we are dependent on increasing numbers because, of course, not everybody needs to rent a house. A lot of people are the very British thing of home ownership, which is not in line with most European countries, but we are a nation of wannabe homeowners as well. We're not providing, like Darius just said, 2023, we built 231,000 houses. I estimate from the figures that I'm being told, we need to be looking at more close to a figure of 1 million new build properties per annum if we're going to remain anywhere near target. But uh, yeah, what's everyone else's thoughts on, on, on Darius's comments? Comes. Everyone's gone shy. I love that. They, they all pretend it? my mic's not working. <laughs> it's, it's going to be difficult to achieve, you know, without pivoting. You know, building properties is is one thing, but repurposing other properties, as we mentioned before, I suppose. Then, uh, you know, your your pubs that are going down the down the pan, repurposing those for for dwellings. You know, that, that seems a, a favourable option to some, but um. The councils have certainly got to go targets now, or they're not so much targets, they, they've got to make them. Whereas before they were nice to have, they were, uh, they're certainly quickly becoming must have. Yeah, and it's, I mean, it's one thing to make a pledge, it's another thing to fulfill a pledge. And I'm certainly not going to slate any political party or any government, but at the same time, like I said earlier, we've just got to wait and see what actually happens because they have made. In my mind, what are very bold pledges towards uh, expanding house building in the United Kingdom? And a lot of people say, well, we haven't got enough room in the United Kingdom. Absolute nonsense. Go on a train ride from London to Newport. And literally, within minutes of being outside of central London, you can just see greenery. Now, I'm not advocating green belt building, green belt building but what I'm also looking at is the possible of conversions. And on our last fortnightly meeting, I was talking about commercial to residential conversions. There's a huge opportunity. People don't seem to be utilising the pubs like they used to. People don't utilise offices like they used to. I mean, COVID put pay to that. COVID showed us that we can all work from home if we're working in administration roles. Even civil servants were working from home. And I now see, like Dale uses the word repurposing, which is a great word, repurposing these buildings as residential buildings. And it's quite funny because on our last meeting, I was talking about the HSBC Tower in London that's owned by the Qataris. And uh, the lease to HSBC, I believe, expires in 2027. They've got an amazing plan to completely transform the building that will include um, leisure, uh, uh, retail, and also residential too. And you can probably see quite a few of these flats in the future there were once offices are being used as flats, well, should I call them apartments because that adds value to them. They've been used as apartments now, but you've probably got two bedroom apartments where a couple live in there and the second bedroom is a home office. So where there was once office clerical administration work going on in a corporation like HSBC, that space will now be used and everybody says well, it's just residential. It's not just residential. These people are actively working from home too. So, there's a huge crossover there, but I think it provides a massive opportunity and a wonderful business model to look at the commercial to residential conversion. Because we're using brownfield, we're, we're repurposing, we're recycling. It's good. It's all really, really positive stuff. We just need to make unlock them, I suppose, by relaxing the planning, planning laws. And that has been done. Permitted development has changed a lot, even with the previous government as well. Um, and there's lots of opportunity now. I think that what we'll see a lot of it as well is the relaxation of the planning laws in town and city centres on ground floor. Traditionally, if you had a ground floor unit, it could not be used for anything else apart from retail or leisure. I think a lot of that will change and it will change the vision of our towns and our cities. Again, COVID was one of the factors that put pay to to our towns and cities when we had the older generation who lots of young people are too busy to go into town or 
you know, go to a specific shop to buy a certain item. So they'd order it via mail order, Amazon, whatever the case is. Now, the older generation had to do that during COVID, during lockdown. They've all realized how to use a computer, a tablet, how to order from Amazon, how they can get their deliveries the same day. So they're now not using towns and cities like they were used before. You know, and I, I went to Cardiff on Saturday. I took my, my eldest stepson's autistic, so I took him on a train ride. And uh, we didn't spend that much time in, in Cardiff, but it was incredible just to walk through the city of Cardiff and see what everyone was doing. Traditionally on a Saturday, most people in Cardiff, and I know this for a fact because I worked there some 32, 33 years ago when I was a Saturday boy in this Cardiff Sony Centre, how long gone, Saturdays were all about retail, shopping, everybody walking around with shopping bags from all the different shops, the independent retailers, the chain stores, the, the department stores. They'd all be walking around with these big bags. You don't see that. I didn't see that on Saturday. I saw thousands of people, the same volume of people, but they were all out eating, drinking, enjoying themselves, enjoying the actual leisure. And that's, that's a significant shift now, isn't it? That's the difference, I think of what 30 years has actually made us and, and, and changed us. So we need to facilitate that. And I think city living, town living is a great thing if it's done right. To be honest with you, I just want to add, you said about planning, being relaxed. Uh, I briefly spoke to Ben. I've come from a property today. They're not a client. Um, where they are adding an... Uh, should we say, it's not an extension because you've got the ground floor with a flat roof, but they've decided to take the flat roof off and build another floor on top. So it brings the roof line together and the extension goes back by about three houses. So it's not a small extension. They're not worrying about planning, guys. They don't, they're not getting planning permission. They're just doing it. So it's... Oh, my God. It's the <laughs> mentalist thing I've ever been to. Um, so, yeah, so I think planning's getting a little bit easier for some. <laughs> Could they, like, I'm technically have to have that taken back yeah. down, though, if someone yeah. does them? There's no, there's no technicality about it. Planning permission by the previous owners was failed to turn it into flats. Um, it will, it literally runs the back of other buildings. So the building runs this way, and these gardens run here. So at the moment, because it's a different level, these gardens are at their roof level. But now it's going to be another level. So they're definitely going to complain. So building control will definitely be out. And it'll definitely be have to be torn down. Um, but they're not worried about planning, guys. So I don't worry about that. No one will notice. It'll be fine. A little bit about planning. I was going to say retrospective planning permission is a very risky game to play. Very expensive at times. And a very risky game to play. Uh, if if they can conceal it for seven years, great. Uh, if they can't, which it doesn't sound like they will be able to, they're in for a very expensive change. And the councils will hold no mercy on them either. Uh, and it's quite often that I've seen in planning, pre-planning. Then you go for planning and you get knocked back and you go for appeal. Now, appeal can change a lot. And it is quite a costly exercise because obviously you've got your professional fees to pay for but at the same time you've not instructed your contractors you've not done the work so it's not really on the same scale as thinking well let's let's get on with it and see what happens in the end because a build like that how many extra units were, were they actually adding jamie he's gone anyway sorry uh i'm just grabbing my my food um there will be they're not converting into flats. They, they haven't decided what they're going to do with it. But I say it's, it's a bit of an awkward scenario. I laugh. Um, it's a bit of an awkward situation. The actual building owner is trying to do right by the family, um, by letting the family be in control. But it's a respect thing because the dad, um, we, I don't think he was aware that, that, that scaffolding up and there was a bricklayer on site when we turned up today. Um, the one I think is a bit of a shock to him as well. Um, but yeah, um, I don't, I don't, it's a big old, it's a big, it's a, it's, it's a problem is the property where it is like, uh, it's been declined for planning permission for flats previously. I think I haven't looked into it yet. I've had a, a, a mental day. Um, the, 
all because of access. Well, you know where it is, Ben. I showed you, I told you where it was. Um, the access to drive. There is parking there, but it's a very tight drive. You couldn't have two car, one car going in and one car coming out, and it's exiting a main road. So it's quite. So I can understand why planning could be difficult, but finding a use for that building would be very difficult because it's an ex-social club. Um, so yeah, it's a it's a very it's a big old building. I would try to get it turned into a children's home if it was me. Um, it's got some massive space, huge space. It had two massive halls, um, outside halls, and got built. It's got eight rooms that didn't even touch the surface of it. And assisted living. That's what I would try to do. But, I was going to say assisted living. You know, it's um, it's a it's a big old property. But that 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 viewing turned into. Uh, I then went and looked at something else that might be getting involved in, which is a hotel. Um, so you, you don't know where. And then after that, to just go back to the homelessness side of things, I had a phone call. Uh, it was from a guy who was 67, I think he said he was. Um, he started off, I've had a, a Barney with my wife. I'm like, okay. I don't know why people think I'm a counsellor, but okay, let's just go. Um, and he said that uh, social services uh, put me in a, a rat-infested property in Malpas. Um, I own a house that's unencumbered, uh, so there's no finance on it with my, my wife. Um, but I need to live somewhere, but the problem is I'm in a wheelchair, you know. So he's now been into social services and emergency house because of that situation. So the emergency housing side of things is is huge and the uh the rate of homes. Like I looked on the planning portal yesterday, I've digressed slightly, and I noticed actually in Rogerstone, um, it is, um, I don't know what the street's called. Do you know where, the? I think it's a co-op, Ben? Yes. By the nook, there's a piece of land just around the corner from there that's got two houses on it. Uh, Newport, I've just put planning permission, it's been granted to knock down the two houses and turn it into 17 flats. Um, so I do think that social housing is going to go down the flat route because they can get more units per square foot to effectively house more people um, as opposed to, you know, building houses. I think that's the, I think that's a, a plan, an unwritten plan they're going for. I was talking to someone this morning who works for Shelter Cymru, which is the charity we did the um, fundraising for. And the numbers of like people in temporary accommodation, obviously he's focusing like on number of kids in temporary accommodation and stuff is just staggering. I can't remember the exact figures and it's into the millions that the government spend on the temporary accommodation. So it just, they're trying to see like, if they could like just spend that on actually converting houses or getting empty houses back into circulation or, you know, all of those sorts of things, or even like buying houses back off landlords that are selling as in private landlords that are coming out. Cause that's like you said, who you touched on it, like where landlords are selling, it's causing a bigger problem because they're making it harder for landlords and for second homeowners. But then at the same time, if private landlords are coming out of the game, it's just another house that's out of circulation for potential renters or so or again, like people that are maybe on social housing and stuff like that. So like there's, two, a... there's two sides to that, isn't there? Um, yeah. And the reason I say there's two sides, uh, if anyone who makes money within property will make money, if they, if they want to make money and they understand, I think education, understanding stuff is important. But if they got rid of private landlords tomorrow, and I, I, I use my, my majority of my my earned income comes from our finance brokerage, but if they got rid of that tomorrow, I can 100% assure you that I would find another way to invest my money to get a return, no matter what it will be, because I, I, that's what I'm driven to do, you know? Um, the So where you go, that if they get rid of investors pull out, does that mean that first-time buyers and everyone else gets more of an opportunity to own a home and that's a better thing from a moral aspect as a devil's advocate? Or you landlords taking homes away from those young um, people? It doesn't really, I don't think, because it comes down to, like, there's other reasons why they're not buying as well, isn't there? Like, the, like so, we're going around in the same circle of, like, the interest rates and things like that. And 
people being able to save deposits for these homes and stuff. So you say that, and this is why I've got another business that we're launching. I'm not going to do a plug here, so I'm not shameless. The business program um, is. Uh, is it not financial education? So when I started in financial services, we used to go out to people's houses. And I anyone that knows me or dealt with me, I would not come to your house. So I've been to houses where people got pet snails walking across the side and then handed me a cup to drink out of. Um, and I've got OCD if anyone knows me. Or I've sat in a chair that the wife told me to sit in a chair and the husband's giving me a grumpy look because that's his chair. Or I've had like weird scenarios, really weird scenarios. So I don't do home employments no more. But the point I want to get to is when I first do it, then home appointments, I used to go to places like Risker, Blackwood, uh, Ebber Vale, and I'd pull up. They've got a brand spanking massive TV on the wall, top of the range, like cars outside, fully kitted houses, but they'll tell me they couldn't afford to buy. Um, so is it not, it's not that they can't afford to buy, to get a deposit to buy. That's a money education point is understanding how to manage money and how to make money. Yeah, my, my son, for those of you who don't know, when he was 13, I'm in finance, obviously. Um, my son, when he was 13, I handed him my bank card to order Disney Plus and I get the notification on my phone. It's like 80 quid. I was like, I thought Netflix, uh, Disney Plus was cheaper than that. He turned around and said to me, I worked out it's cheaper to buy it for the year than it is to pay it for monthly. So I bought it for the year. And that's because I'm in finance. I've taught him money management, you know? So... Going back to first-time buyers not being out, I think that's just an education thing in terms of education is key. I learn every day. I've, I've got, I'll show you, I've got, I won't show you the book, one book there, another book that I'm reading. So I'm literally reading every day, you know, and I think it's an educational point of view. Uh, education is key. To earn more, learn more. Um so I don't think first-time buyers is deposits, unfortunately. So I've got my little wrap. I think a lot of people are not in a position uh, because of their employment status. And it is hard to get a, a residential mortgage today. It's a lot harder than it used to be. And I don't think that these people, sometimes by no fault of their own, are not in a position to buy a property. So they have to rent a property. What doesn't help, though, is what I was saying earlier, is the nation is dependent upon private rental stock and what doesn't help is when you get for example i'm not going to name any names but a so say housing charity who actually do not house one single person themselves will give tenants advice and the advice they give them for example could be you've been issued a section 21 eviction notice by your landlord so therefore ignore it and wait for the bailiff to turn up that means it's going to cost the landlord not only the cost of the Section 21, we're now getting into court fees, solicitor fees, bailer fees, et cetera, et cetera. Do you think that landlord is seriously going to consider keeping their property or indeed their portfolio of properties after they've been treated like that? No, they are not. That's why so many private landlords are exiting the marketplace. What the housing charity should be doing well, first of all, certain housing charities, again, naming no names, should have every member of staff removed from them and they should be set up to help tenants. So that if a tenant says, I have been issued a Section 21 eviction notice, now we don't know why that notice has been issued. It could be the fault of the tenant. It could be the change of circumstances for the landlord. For example, the landlord could, be, uh, could have uh, a member of their family awaiting emergency surgery which they've chosen that they will pay for and they have the assets so therefore they can pay for it now if that was the case for example and that's not possible because a certain housing charity has advised the tenants to cost the landlord and create havoc amongst them then in my mind that's not really fair what they should be doing is saying, well, you've been issued a Section 21. Let's abide by the Section 21. Let's help you into your next property. Let's not get you into a situation where you've got to take council emergency accommodation because your landlord won't give you a reference because we've advised you to screw them over. And that is why I would never advocate a certain housing charity naming no names. There we go. That's my that's my tuppence worth on that. And it's shelter, shelter. 
<laughs> I yeah. believe I, to be honest though I, I, I didn't mention met, any um, particular housing charity I could have been talking about one if not multiple housing charities I think they all do it anyway. I was just telling and the like, boys the shelter those, those housing charities that do not house a single person and what I'd advise everyone to do if they're questioning my demeaning of these housing of, of these housing charities have a look at the director's remuneration Mm. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, like I said, I'm not naming any particular housing charity because there are many of them. But there we go. I um, when a, well, more of an acquaintance and a friend, a friend of a friend is a well, she works in housing, and she said she openly said the first thing they say if they've had given a notice is just don't do anything, don't move, just stay. Because they know that if they do get evicted or when they get evicted, because they are going to get evicted at some point, they're going to be faced with having to find them somewhere else to go that they don't have. So they even the housing officers all give them the same advice. And it's like, oh, my God, don't tell me that. <laughs> I don't want to know. Um, what, what do you think? How is it going to work out when they're talking about, like, with the whole abolishing Section 21 and stuff like that? Is that going to... Because for there's a lot of, like, people have been asking... I mean, I don't do lettings, but people have been asking me about, well, what happens if that goes and how... What if I just want to sell my house? I can't just give notice. And I was like, yeah, I, that's a good question. They're going to have to replace it or put something into Section 8, I guess, are they? Well, of course, that they've they've got to. Otherwise, if, for example, there was no other exit option for landlords who have a property or an existing portfolio, as soon as these plans and these measures are announced and they're dissected and they read and they find out there's no secondary exit option, what will they do? They'll so, choose to so, issue the section yeah. to every single property they've actually got. And they'll either mm -hmm. sell the property... Uh, they they could choose to keep the property and repurpose it as service accommodation, for example, which would wind the hell out of the, all these other people that are going on about there's too much service accommodation, it's taking all the good rental stock, et cetera, et cetera. But at times, when you look at it from not a subjective, but an objective point of view, when you look at service accommodation, Airbnb, as it's commonly known as, when you look at the benefits of that now, and you look at, in Wales, our rental contracts. Let's say, for example, that we have a tenant entering our property on a 12-month contract, and we have a change of circumstance a few months into this contract. We've got to wait until the 12-month date to issue them their six-month notice. So let's say two months in, we have a change of circumstance. We've then got to wait 16 months before we can obtain possession of this property, and that's providing that one of the housing charities hasn't got these people and informed them of the right way in their mind to do things, AKA break the law and stay in the property until the bitter end, until the court fees, the bailiffs. These solicitors who work on behalf of landlords, they must be cock a hoop at what's going on. They must be absolutely in glee because they know they're gonna get the work from it. They're gonna get the fees from it. The landlord's gonna pay the fees because they've got to, they've got no other choice. Now, let's say that we get to that scenario and we're very lucky and the tenant decides to behave themselves and they haven't contacted a well-known housing charity and been informed of how to screw them over, then they leave. But that's still 16 months and this emergency situation could be happening very quickly. If the tenant has had advice or they decide of their own means not to leave, and this could run into two, possibly, and this is not an exaggeration, but possibly three years. Now, if you're offering serviced accommodation, now, serviced accommodation must be done in a compliant fashion. That's the absolute must. So many people that I see out there in the property world, and I know a lot of people, uh, Jamie will tell you, I, I know an awful lot of people in this property world, comes with the grey hair, been around. So many people are doing it on a non-compliant basis. But if you do it on a compliant basis, where you have the correct permissions, the correct um uh, compliance in place to run your service accommodation offering. Let's say, for example, you're doing short-term stays or you're doing mid-term stays. Mid-term stays are typically where you have, for example, a property and uh, there's contractors who are from outside the area are working on a local projects. Their company may choose to rent your accommodation for a month or three months or six months. 
That's what's known as a midterm stay. So they rent it for six months. Now, you can have bookings for the next 12 months all stacked up. If an emergency situation happens, then obviously you've got to respect the existing booking, the existing client that's in the property, not tenants, the clients, the, the existing clients that's in that property. But you can, and it's not a great thing to do, but if push came to show, you could cancel all future bookings. So therefore, let's say, for example, your existing client in that property is only booked in until the end of August. You know that you'll take possession of that property at the end of August because you can cancel all future bookings. It's a bit like running a hotel that has a fire, for example, you know, or there's, um, you know, if you go on holiday and, and you chose to book into a resort and they've, they've had an earthquake or a volcano or a, a monsoon or whatever the case is, you would expect that they'll probably cancel your holiday. They'll cancel your accommodation and you'll have to find an alternative. So you can quite easily cancel it and know that you can take possession. If your existing client's in there till the end of August and they decide to be a bit naughty and want to stay on longer, on the 1st of September, you can take the police round and they will evict them for you because they are trespassing, because that is the way that this contract is actually made up. And in my mind, whilst I was quite adverse to it over many years, it's now becoming a seriously good proposition based upon the legislation that we're being faced with. And we're in a housing crisis. We have not replenished our social housing stock for donkey's years. We've sold most of it off under the council right to buy scheme. We are dependent on private rental stock. So why is this happening? Sorry, I get a bit aerated when I talk about this. Why is this happening? You tell me. There we go. I'll stand down off the soapbox now. <laughs> Anyone got anything to add? Everyone's mic's broke again. It's amazing how these mics keep breaking. Um, <laughs> I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bully someone. I'm going to bully someone. Actually, I've got something to add um, that Lisa's just messaged me on this second because uh, she knew I was probably going to pick her up. Darius wants to speak. Uh, Darius, you're one of the people I've sent a text message to. Uh, Dale, I've sp I did try bringing you Darius, but I've sent you a text message. Reese, I've spoken to you. Katie, I think you've done. Uh, I'm not too sure, Rakeen, I've done about yourself. Uh, we're doing our next networking event on the 20th of August. It's actually gone live in the group at 7 o'clock this evening, I think. I say I think because someone else does it for me. So there's meant to post in the South Wales Property Group at 7 o'clock this evening. The tickets are now open to general admission. So if you want to come, and I don't, Lisa says she's booked the ticket. Uh, I don't think she has. Oh, we're there. There she you did. have. I've had a text message did. to confirm I did. She did. I've got hi, Lisa. Congratulations. Your space is reserved. No, I, Take I wrote it that. back. I wrote that message personally. I, as you put the ticket, I quickly typed it up and sent it yeah, to you. Yeah, you've got to write um, doors open 6.30 and then you've written kick out 7pm. And I was like, wait, it's a half an hour. And then I was yeah. like, oh, you need to kick off. <laughs> Did I? Uh, yeah. That's that's because I'm typing quick. Well, see, I'm typing. Are you going to kick me out in half an hour? No, we we kick you out at six thirty when you come in. Yeah. Um, you so let me in. So any of you that don't know, we normally do monthly events. The last venue, uh, there's a great venue in terms of PA system and screen. Um, the venue was very let us down. Um, or, like we'd get there, the mics weren't working, or the screen wasn't working. Everyone's in the room. None of you guys would know it, but I'd be like 50 pence, 20 pence, thinking I've got nearly 100 people in a room and nothing's working. Um, and then on the last event, they had they put on some event, some, I want to say, you know when the washed up stars do the, the rounds of the pubs? You know when they do that? When they were famous and they're no longer famous and they go around do nightclubs? Um, they had one of those in. So they was like, we can't confirm because they want to do rehearsals. Um, so they let us down on the June, but we're now in the McCure Hotel in Newport, which I don't think will let us down just simply because of the brand. We are doors open at 6.30. Tickets are available on events.notebookmoney.co.uk. Tracy, you already, I spoke to Darren, you already sorted, you're fine. Yeah, we can. Um, the, 
different room, much brighter. And this one actually has got a rooftop bar. Now, I don't actually drink, guys. I know you've seen me drink two beers tonight. Oh, it's been a that. really hard day today. <laughs> really, really hard day. Um, so uh, hopefully we'll be able to go up on the rooftop bar after the educational part of it and socialise from there. You don't have to. There'll be teas and coffee supplies as per usual. Much more expensive, though, than Vibes, I'll be honest. But we know, again, they'll have enough cups to do everyone. And like Vibes, that we'll pay for coffee and they'll be like, oh, we've run out of cups. Um, or milk. So Yeah, so... Um, well, no, we had to go out and buy milk when they meant to supply it. It's really weird. So uh, Meg would go out and run out and get it. But, yeah, so new venue, the 20th of August, 6.30, kick off. Kick out at 7 if your name's Lisa. Um, and I think it'll be a good venue. Darius, you should have a text message. Why are these two in bed? <laughs> Thanks for joining us, guys. <laughs> uh, <laughs> this is, this is a different kind of Zoom all of a sudden. <laughs> that's, that's why I couldn't put the camera on, mate. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll be honest with you, Craig. You need to work a little bit harder. There's no sweat. I'm just saying. No sweat. Hey, I, I haven't had a shower yet. I'm still covered in dust. <laughs> I'm yeah, filthy. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We're uh, hiding from the kids. The um, Hiding from the kids by making more kids. Hmm. Um, uh, uh, so in the group I think just so hands by show of hands Lisa you've got your ticket from Reese you've got yours Dale you've got yours Sparrow I don't think you've been to an event before have you Um, if you want to check it out the link is events.notebookmoney.co.uk that has full details on there you can get a a ticket Uh, Tracy and Darren have got their ticket Craig and Laura got their ticket. Shalinia, I don't know. Uh, I think you may have had a ticket previously. Um, I've had it previously, but I haven't booked this one as yet. No. As yet, see, hold you. We'll all wait for you to book it now. We'll do. I'm only joking. Uh, Kate, uh, Katie, because uh, you're not Kate, you're Katie there, forgive me. I think that your ticket is transferred, I think. Um, yeah, I think so. That's what I had the text saying. Yeah. Uh, well, did you did you confirm you wanted it transferred? Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So that that's good. Cool. Uh, Sophie, I don't think you've been before. Um, the Rakina. Uh, am I trying to get hold of you, Rakina? Let's go and have a look. Um, yeah, I sent you a, t- uh, a request, Rakina. Sam, I don't know. Antonio. Okay, I look now. Thank you. Uh, the the uh, Sam, Antonio, no, Gary. I don't know if you're. Uh, I think you've got a text. Gary, Cecilia, you live in God's country in, in London. Well, actually, Milton Keynes. I bet you call it Milton Keynes. Um, Mona's iPhone. I think, Mona, you did have a text message from memory. Um, waiting on Dara. So quite a lot of people come if you haven't been before. Um, I'm quite looking forward to the new venue. The new venue is much brighter. Um, I'm actually hoping to give you an idea. We're not... I'm going to do this one without a PA system and without a screen. We're going to see how it goes because the room is much more condensed. It's a much smaller venue. If we need to, on the next event, we'll uh, buy a PA system if we need to. Um, But I'm hoping by the next event, we can actually do the two rooms. So we can do uh, a speaker on one side, education on the other, maybe. Uh, So halfway through, stop and go to the other room. Um, And there's like a nice little networking area, sofas. Nice. I like it. Anyway, Ben, did you like it? I loved it. I thought it was great. It was a really, really nice environment to be in. Yes, it's good. The only thing I think is a bit bad is the mobile phone signal is not the best in the room. Um, but I've got no friends, so it doesn't make a difference to me. Um, so, yeah. Um, so if we'll you all be there. Yeah, be it's, there. Honestly, it's a really nice hotel. I think they took a bit of offence when they showed us their suites up on the 15th floor. And I told them they reminded me of a bed set. But apart from that... It's a really nice place. Yeah, it was good there. So uh, we can't see them being. I think they just didn't seem very booked. And like they sent me the invoice, and there's no VAT on it, uh, which really surprises me. Like, really surprises me because. So hang on a second. They spent 15 million quid converting that building, and they're not that registered. They they must be. They uh, there's no VAT on on the invoices. That's really weird. Which surprised and the head chef, she won't mind me saying the head chef in the building. It's actually a client of ours, which is quite un- not quite unusual. It's quite usual for us to go places because we're a big firm in terms of client numbers. 
that we've always got a client somewhere in the business, if that makes sense. Um, so I know what, and it just surprised me when I received it. I was like, not when I've, I've gone back and questioned it today. Um, so, yeah. Well, the bill will probably go up now by 20%. They'll go, oh, yeah, it's plus 20%. Why did I say anything? Um, but yeah. Um, the silence. Anyone got anything to add? Because I, I know we try and keep it to an hour for these networking meetings because I know you've all got family commitments and work commitments, etc. Has anyone any questions? Anything you want to add? Because Darius did have his hand up at one point. Let's go on oh. can, can you hear me now? Sorry. Yeah, can hear you now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, sorry, I just ch ch changed the device. So I wasn't sure if that <clears throat> microphone is working on the, on the, new, oh. on the other setup. Um. So I was I was recently uh, I sort of go back to a bit of a uh, more um, direct regional question on the on the property um, sort of trajectory and the pricing. Um, so I'm very interested in Pontypridd as an area for the for the investment, uh, and I did mention quite a, quite a few times. So I sort of feel a bit uh, redundant mentioning it again in a sense. Um, but I was I'm, I'm looking at some properties in in last week or so, and I'm quite curious of what is your approach of try. And I know it's a very difficult question to answer, but how do you try to project or assess historical uh, market appreciation in a particular region? Um, is it going through land registrar or, or are there any other better tools, far better tools to sort of assess that? Can I add on something that quickly? Because I know Ben will be able to do. Um, and the one thing I just want to add very quickly is uh, people say this all the time in terms of tools. And the unfortunate thing with tools is you can look at, you look at a, a, a geographical postcode and that geographical postcode could be like 8% um, average growth per year in the last three years. I'll use that because that's what property data says. But there's somebody in this group on this Zoom, I'm not going to mention any names, who looked at a property very recently and they were getting end values. In fact, there's two people in this group, actually, uh, on this call. There's two. There's actually two of you. I'm not going to say. There's, you can play the game like guess who. Do they have blonde hair? Uh, the Where... They were looking at property values, and in one street, it was, let's call it £100,000. But in the street over, it was like £85,000. There can be a massive variation between the street, which, unfortunately, when you look at data sources, again, I'll go to property data, it's just looking at MP24, not MP24ET, MP24H. They can't work out. So you could be going up. This has an average of 8%, but the variant without knowing the area and doing a little bit more research, I think that when people look for tools, I think it shoots them in the foot personally. I think do the work. It's just my opinion. And I think Ben will tell me I'm wrong. No, I think it's a very difficult thing to say because in my mind, we've got to move forward looking forward. Okay. Now, if you look at historical data, a lot can change. There's a lot of variables in historical data. For example, you can get certain areas that become very popular. Like, I'll give you an example now. When I was selling houses back in the late 90s, early 2000s in West London, yeah, I was covering Ealing, Acton and Chiswick. So we had W3, W4, W5. Acton was the poor relative. It had the best transport links, but it was the poor relative. Ealing, W5, so Acton was W3. Ealing, W5 was very strong. But Chiswick, W4, was immense. Everybody wants and aspires to live in Chiswick, the Chiswick High Road of Chiswick. Everybody wants to say that they live in W4. It was quite funny. Foxton's estate agents used to put on their details, Chiswick, W3. It's like, that's not right. It's not, it's not Chiswick, that's Acton, mate. And would you believe it, if you cross over the Westway... You've literally got a dual carriageway. You cross over the dual carriageway and your property prices rise by anything up to 50%. Purely because a lot of people want to stand at the school gates and say, well, I live in Chiswick. I don't live in Acton. I live in Chiswick. 
that's a massive difference. Also, variance can happen. For example, if you lived in a certain area and they said to you, we are going to build a new railway station, not in your back garden, but within a quarter of a mile from your house, HS2, for example, that would put a massive spike on your property value. And I saw this, not with railway stations, but I saw this in 2018. In 2018, the two Seven Bridges, the old Seven Bridge and the um, Prince of Wales Bridge, the new Seven Bridge, were both handed back to the government. They were, when traditionally the Seven Bridge was built, it was government owned. And then in the 1990s, when they started building the second Seven Crossing, both bridges were handed over to the French construction company, John Lang. And they had an agreement to run it for so many years, they could take the tolls and that would pay for the construction of the second seven crossing. They could make their profit, then they'd hand it back. 2018 was the year they had to hand it back, which they did. The government decided, not a great decision in, in my mind, but I won't go down that because I'll, I'll go down a different pathway here. They decided to scrap the tolls of the seven bridge. Now, they should have kept them based upon the maintenance needed for the bridges. But anyway... They decided to scrap those seven bridge tolls. And although the seven bridge toll, I think at its peak, and uh, one member on here, Katie and Ian Honeychurch can probably correct me on this because they're, they're from Bristol. Uh, I think at the peak, it was about, because they only used to charge one way. I think at the peak, it was about six pounds 50. So you- That's about looking, right, I think. Yeah, it was about I think six pounds in my head, I think. Sorry? I think six forty. because the sign's still up, isn't it, on the one part, it says. yeah. So you don't have to pay one way. So if you were daily commuting to Bristol, you could actually buy what was called a seven tag. And that used to give you a discount on this. But when they abolished those tolls, literally every property on the east side of Newport, so everything that was east of the Bring Glass Tunnels, the bottleneck in Newport, shot up in value like you would not believe. Mm. Now, if you looked at historical data and you didn't know about these factors, these man-made factors that came into this, you would look at that and think, wow, any property on the east side of Newport is the place to buy because the capital appreciation is phenomenal. So what I'm trying to get at is that I don't think any historical data is going to be that accurate as to future events that will happen, if that makes sense. That's only my opinion. But I think if you buy in an area, look at the demographics, look at the percentage of home ownership, look at the percentage of, of uh, owner occupiers, look at the percentage of employment, Look at the transport, the road, the rail, the bus links, etc. Look at those. And if you buy a property that's easily accessible in an area that's quite densely populated, I don't think you will fail. Because those communication networks are only going to get better, not worse, if we go on what's always happened in the past. Does that make sense, Darius? Um, yes, thank you. So my thesis with Pontypridd, and, and, and I did the same before as well, is because of the university, the the metro system and just just generic spillover from Cardiff being the case, and that is my thesis of uh, property value appreciation in Pontypridd being quite attractive um, going forward for probably next decade or two decades. I would sort of um, dare to 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 prophesize. Yeah, and I think that certain things can add value to properties, like if there's a university in the area. But again, I mean, we were blown in, in Wales when obviously South Wales was basically built upon industrial revolution and, and the coal mines. The industry's gone, the coal mines have, have, have all gone now, which was a, a downward trajectory for, for, for most areas in South Wales. But there's certain areas that have survived because of the transport links. I've always believed in this, that if you get property in an area that's got good transport links. Cardiff is always going to be the capital of Wales, so I believe. And you've got the transport links then to uh, Newport, through Newport, and then through to London, through to Bristol, through the West Country, etc. I think that if you look at properties in areas like this, you've got to expect that because they, in years to come, they could close Pontypridd, the university. They could close the Trafford, you know, that could all go. It did in Killian. There was there was quite a big campus in Killian in Newport. And that will close. They're currently building new houses. The beautiful old building, luckily, it's been preserved and they're building flats in there, but they're building houses. And you had a residential university there in Killian that literally, with 
very short notice closed overnight. So I think these attractive features of a certain destination can come and go very quickly. So I think we are best looking at connectivity, transport links, etc. That's that's wonderful. Thank thank you for your input. No, absolutely wonderful and a great question. Has anyone else got any questions before we head off for this Tuesday evening? Everyone's silent. I'm going to rush off tonight. Leo's already asleep. <laughs> Thanks to be Guys, thank you so much for joining. This talking. is apple juice, Dale. I just fill it up with apple juice. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for joining us, everyone. We look forward to seeing you on our next Tuesday evening fortnightly webinar. Ooh. What? We have a problem. And I've only just realised that you've said it. What? You booked the, booked the day on a Tuesday. I booked the event on a Tuesday, two weeks today. Yeah. yeah. Well, if anyone wants a refund on their tickets, contact Jamie. This event is entirely free of charge. Uh, the, uh, can I have a refund, please? <laughs> <laughs> Do you know, we don't actually make any money from the events, the tickets. It just covers the cost of the venue, just to put that out there. I'm not sitting there doing, yep, yeah, let's, let's live the high life. I can assure you, we, we actually, on the last venue, we lost lots of money. Um, it was we the did. last venue. Was really... It was the milk. The, uh... <laughs> yeah. I we, thought no... you'd done it on a Tuesday on purpose. I thought um, it was like, these were like the, you know, like we do the in-face and then the online and the in-face or face-to-face. -face. Yeah. I thought it was a deliberate. Yeah, was it not a deliberate? Who gave permission for Lisa to talk? Did anyone give permission for Lisa to talk? You just oh, I thought you did Aww. it on <laughs> Uh, no, so the the, the 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 actual reason for it originally it was going to be the Thursday, and then uh, McHugh, uh the person who's gone to McHugh, who's doing us a, hopefully a bit of a deal, is someone that I know who's left BMW to go into work there as their events manager, um, and that's how the conversation started. Um, and originally she'd done Thursday, but she didn't realise they actually have something in that's always in on a Thursday, so we went to a Tuesday. And I wanted to do it in August, but everyone is saying don't do it in August because everyone goes away in August and summer holidays and people, so it's hard as getting numbers in the room, which uh, I don't know if I've had any response from the group. We, we should have, I'm hoping, if I'm honest, I'm hoping that we don't get massive amounts because it'll be the first time in the venue is understanding what works, what don't, because it's a new setup. And also, it'd be nice to chat to people because when it's full, it's really hard uh, to work the room. I don't want to say work, that's wrong, but everyone wants to talk to you and you, you can't tie up and, and then afterwards you're knackered. Um, yeah, only if you say hello to everyone first. Come say hello first. Hello. Wave, say hello. hello. Say hello, South Wales Property Investments. Hello. Come on in, quick. Sorry, I've got this rule that... <coughs> say, there we go. Say hello. Hello. Say, my name Hello. is Avram. My name is Avram. A.K.A. <laughs> Say, A.K.A. A.K.A. Fuzzed. Fuzzed. <laughs> Be clearly, okay? Daddy's hey, only jealous. Oh, very. Yeah, very. say, at least I got her, Daddy. Pretty, uh... <laughs> um, so I'm hoping it's not a full venue because I think it'd be nice to be able to the rooftop bar is fantastic, isn't it, Ben? Um, it's it is. A, it's really good. Consider it's Newport. Really you wouldn't realise you're in Newport. It's a really nice setup. Pick me no. up. Hello? I don't have to drive. I said, is anyone going by a Caffili that can pick me up so I don't have to drive? I'm, I'm taking a tap of Tracy and Dad. Good idea, actually. <laughs> I, um... Please, we can pick you up. Oh, I, I was joking because I was thinking like... I, I was joking, but my address is... <laughs> <laughs> I hear rooftop bar and I'm like, ooh, that sounds like gin o'clock. You can get a bus. Yeah. It's right by the bus station. Yeah, that's true. Right, but it would Where are you guys? Madam? We're in Bather, so we'll be passing via, like, not too far from Caffili. Ray's like, oh, shut wait, I'll wait on the A470 for you. <laughs> Designated yeah. driver. I ain't driving. <laughs> But I, on a, on a serious note, so I'm laughing and joking this evening because I'm really like I've had one of those days. I act like a child. I'm really looking forward to this venue. Um, I do think it'd be nicer. Uh, I do think. What are you doing? So we got coconut water because 
that's the youth of today, coconut water, um, not tap water. And he's decided to take his bottle lid and put it inside the coconut water so the straw goes in and he can drink it like that. The youth, privileged is what, in my day, is spoiled, but apparently the correct term now is privileged. It's not as called expected, I believe. The um, <laughs> Honestly, if you... We spend like forty pound a week on fruit. Firm forty pound a week on fruit. That's your choice. My my parents would be like, you've had, <laughs> yeah. you've had a yogurt that had fruit bits. <laughs> That'll <would> do. <laughs> <laughs> Look at all the stuff you could you could afford another house, Jamie, if you didn't buy them fruit. Honestly, you you wouldn't believe <laughs> the amount of money. If I told you what we spend, my eldest is expensive, but. What I meant to say, because she can hear me upstairs and you're all going to desert me in a second. It's worth every penny, guys. I wouldn't change it. You know, <laughs> it's an investment in our kids' future. See, you guys trying to stitch me up and get me killed. Um, but on a, on a, a note, I am looking forward to the event. Um, Do you intend on keeping it on a Tuesday? Um, I don't know. I don't know. But one of, one of the things is, it's re- you can't please it every, no matter what the event no matter what, I can tell you now, uh, and it is, people have a go, they have a moan, and you get sometimes, you can get you at the wrong point, you think, why do I bother? Um, the And then you realise later on, why well, because it's nice to connect and speak to people, but no matter what happens, you'll always get someone that moans about something. Like, on the last event, it was cancelled, yet yeah, we sent tickets out, we sent emails out, text messages out, and someone still turned up to the event, and he had a massive like <laughs> anyone who who paid for a ticket, you was instantly offered a refund or transferred. There's no like, oh, that's it, like instantly. But they had, but yeah, that was my fault. Um, so another thing, like um, the only, the only one I can think of, and I can only think of Tracy because of Craig and Laura here, and it wasn't them at <laughs> Makers where someone said the venue was too dark, um, <laughs> yeah. like. Um, the, I don't know. I can't remember that. No, no, it wasn't you. It wasn't you. No, we knew no. who it was. But um, <laughs> like you can. So going back to, but what I'd really like to get to a point of is I'd really like to get to a point of having different professionals in trades that come in. Um, like I find it really difficult to come on a weekend, Saturday and Sunday. I'm doing sports of one thing or another. I'm at one sports event or another. That's that's every weekend. It's not. If I'm not in, like, my one son, he's in Nottingham. I've been Nottingham, Birmingham, Coventry. I was meant to go to Ireland, the Netherlands. Like, I'm so weekends are very hard for me, but those are sacrifices that I make, so I enjoy doing them for, and then do. So understanding that people have those sacrifices, rugby training, football training. I want to get the people that don't come to come as well. Now, what may happen is the venue is a much smaller venue, and it may be trial and error that we end up going, well, we do two events a month, one on a Tuesday evening and one on a Sunday morning. Um, and that gives the opportunity then for people to come to the both or to the one. Um, the thing is, like, I generally, I think I lost, I think this cost me between four, about 400 to 500 pounds I was losing every time I do an event. Now, that comes out of my pocket and that's like stuff that I could be doing with my family, if that makes sense. So the new... I think you- I think like you said though, Jamie, like you you made the sacrifice. So I think the people who are motivated to be there will either go or they won't. Like you'll never like you said, you'll never please everyone. Like so it is really difficult. I think you're damned if you do, damned if you do don't half the time. So the who doesn't like a Tuesday here? Uh, Lisa, Tuesday, Tuesday, uh, Tuesday, 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 they, like Tuesday they work Wednesday, no, I work Tuesday. Tuesday's <laughs> fine. Uh, well, when I spoke to Lisa about this, was it yesterday, Lisa? I spoke to Lisa. Lisa? Yeah. You know, you uh, her, her words, let me tell you her words to me, guys, and you take it. On a Tuesday, no, I have she, late appointments with clients. Them. I'm just saying, I don't know what late appointment with clients. I, <laughs> I don't know what late appointment. I'll just show the message about, you as well. I'll show the you message. Said- you said about pushing it back an hour and I said doesn't make any difference to me I I try and be here but technically like if it's back an hour it just means if I've got evening appointments it's less of a rush to get back for that but 
I, I think the bottom line is, is that when people are booking a ticket or if they want to be there, they'll make it happen, won't they? No, no, I that's don't my, that's now. my opinion. That's just my opinion. Um, yeah. The, um, uh, I, I, everyone's different, but we'll see, we'll see. You, you, what I'm trying to say is you can try and make it as easy as possible for people to be there and as convenient as possible. And there will still be someone who says, oh, that doesn't work because, like, they just will be. I think the timing for the face-to-face -face as well works quite well because if people want to factor it into, like, they could come straight from work if they have to and stuff like that, you know? Well, I'll be honest. This is my honest opinion. and I'm an honest person. I went to PIN, Property Investor Network in Cardiff, and I still remember going to it, and it really annoyed me because they said it starts at like 6.30. I'm coming from Newport, so I rushed there. I didn't have food after a long day in work. Now, I don't. my wife messages me to say, don't forget to eat, because I'll just get stuck in my work. So maybe I'm a different to other people. But um, I rushed there, and I thought to myself, you know, I'm here, I'm starving hungry now. And I didn't finish until like 8.30, 9 o'clock. And I thought I've been in work all day. So I didn't like the Tuesday. That was my experience. But I'm hoping that we have a better experience. Like you see me. I don't mean to be horrible, guys. I'm good, thanks, dude. Cheers, though, mate. Um, that I will eat, I drink. I'm not here to impress you or anything. I just want to be myself. And these are what these meetings are about. They're informal, have a chat with people. So I think that if we create that environment where, you know, we're not trying to be fake and against because people like a very I, I think people are fake oh yeah i'm unapproachable i do this i do that well i don't think we're creating that environment so if you come you was eating a sandwich or you grab something from the bar i don't think anyone will have that difference in our environment um so it might be different we, we shall see we shall see um we shall see i just heard rooftop bar so it's fine i'll be happy <laughs> <laughs> In regards to the venue over there, because I'm not from Newport, so I don't really know it that well. Um, because I might be coming straight from work, I'm not sure what time I'll finish exactly. And my my van is around two meters. So park just... at the back of my office. Oh, is it? Yeah, park at the back of my office. Okay, I was just thinking because obviously I'm, I'm a bit restricted with the height of the van, and I some car parks over there. I was quite worried, so I was uh, just looking at the map. You could park on the road. There's certain roads you could park on behind yours, too, minute. No, no, not until eight o'clock because uh, they changed the times. But the back of the yeah, office, no. I know I, where I, it is, Darius. I don't, I, I don't want to say that I will be just because my last customer is up in Barry, and the joy of the day might be that the traffic will just go against me. But I sort of do my best to 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 make there. Um, so I'm just sort of looking at the map now. So is the is that a Mercury Hotel? Is that where's my Mickey? So you know where my coffee shop used to be in the Westgate building? Yes. You can see that building, that shop from the rooftop bar. That's how close it is. It's on the same line, same strip. Merc Mercury Newport Grand, yeah. Okay. So I I'm conscious of the time because I normally shoot off at eight to put Leo to bed. Down it, down it, down it. Uh, that was Darren. Uh, uh, Spyro, do you plan to come? Yes, but yeah. I'm, I'm I'm in the group, so um, I can probably get the link from there. I think I was I think I was away last time when the um, the the previous event was on, which I think we spoke about was a few weeks ago. But uh, I'll be there. I'm planning on being there. I heard rooftop terrace as well, so I'm I'm definitely. <laughs> well, honestly. Like I will recently... be on the rooftop. I agree with you, but just be at the top. <laughs> the I've um I've recently discovered uh, a place called the Fugitives in Newport, which is a social club. A member, and it's like my new favorite. I've lived in Newport now for twenty five years. Uh, no, twenty years. No, twenty four years. Twenty twenty years. It's more than twenty years. I never <laughs> knew this place existed. I now go there every Friday, and this rooftop bar is like such a kept secret in Newport. That no one knows about, like, but then I think we Newport as a whole has a slightly different demographic that they don't like the nicer things in life. Maybe um, if you're paying more than one pound for a pint, I think they're disappointed. Um, happy to have the drags out the, the the wastage. How many years exactly have you lived in Newport for? Come on, let's just get this straight now. Well, 
<laughs> I, long ago, but... I got adopted when I'm 11. So we'll work it out. I got adopted when I was 11. It's my birthday Saturday. Um, and I'm 37. So 20. More than Lanny. What? Well, you <laughs> 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 Sorry, I clicked the 35 I James, I thought you was. <laughs> Listen, I've had a hard life. I was in care, so I aged, okay? It's not my fault. You're bringing back all my bad memories now. Oh, right, guys. Do not let him do this, right? Uh, if, for example, I'm late for an appointment, right, or I say to him, I'll be in the office tomorrow and I get held up on site looking after my valued clients, I get text messages from him saying, this reminds me of when I was in care, waiting for someone to turn up and you never oh, could. Oh. Like, <laughs> but I'm used to it now. Like, no sympathy. Sorry, guys. No oh, sympathy. Seven. Guys, if you don't if you don't roll with the dices, you know what we do. I'm just playing the I'm just playing the hand that I've been dealt with. That's all I can do. That's all I can do. Oh, God. I, can I know. Do. Bless you. Bless you. But um, no, I think it's going to be a wonderful venue for us to have. I think the rooftop terrace is going to be awesome. Just before we go, Reese, I'm picking on you now. It's not unusual. Go on. It's all right, Tom Jones. It's Reese Jones, not Tom Jones. Um, he Reece. could have been my dad. Who knows? Like... <laughs> I'm too young to be a dad. Jamie can be a dad. He, he's older than me. Um, <laughs> you've now sold both properties and completed on one, yeah? So uh, there was a delay. We are completing on Thursday. Awesome. It's exchanged, though. It is. So it is going Ooh. through. So it's an irreversible contract. So basically, Castle Street's gone, and we yeah. sold subject to contracts the Granville Street property. Yeah, so that one, I have signed all the contracts. They are with the solicitor. So there's a couple of questions left from their solicitors, but it's all sort of going through. So hopefully, a couple of weeks, that one will be gone too. Well, that was a long journey, and a massive congratulations to you for your perseverance, your hard work, your tenacity in there and a massive congratulations to lisa who sold them both for you so guys what a absolutely communal result that was so thanks guys and uh, well done guys all good Thank you. They're, they're fab you've done such a good job on them reese and i said earlier you need to give yourself a big pat on the back because i know you didn't have an easy ride with them with either of them yeah. so <laughs> it, yeah it was difficult but we got there in the end um but we're not you know, totally out of the woods. You know, the ink's not dry, so it's not totally done. We'll be fine. <laughs> but um, yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm happy it's all happened. So thank you, Lisa. That was um, oh, you're more than welcome. Quicker than expected as well. So awesome result. Five right? star Three. reviews all round. Ah. Please for both of you. That was a great result. Absolutely great result. Yeah, so yeah, and and thanks to Ben as well for all the um, all the help because there's been. Uh, more than one issue on that on those properties. So uh, yeah, I think uh, it's been we a lot. Of the support we rode together, mate. We rode that <laughs> boat together. So thank you, mate. No, it's been my absolute pleasure to mentor you and your cat. Um, um, yeah. <laughs> what was it? Blofeld on the old James Bond films, wasn't it? He did this there stroking his cat there. You know, he's, yeah, he's, yeah, he's yeah. I feel like that sometimes. <laughs> he just joins in like every meeting I've got at work, and just everyone's like, right, this guy again. <laughs> Awesome. <laughs> but thanks, guys. Look forward to seeing you in the flesh soon. Obviously, this will be cancelled in lieu of Jamie's more important meeting. I can't offer a roof top bar on um, on Zoom, but uh, yeah, <laughs> look forward to seeing you all soon. Thanks, guys. Take care. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye. Good night. Have a good night. Thanks. <laughs>